my name is Nathalie Blanc. Uh, I am a director of research, which is a bit different from a professor in France, meaning that I am exclusively dedicated to research, but I will teach you, as you can see today. I am a geographer, and I'm not an economist, uh, which is very important, because uh, there is a big difference between economy and geography. And uh, how, how do you envision this difference? How do you see this difference? What would you say about the difference between economy and geography? I discovered it myself <laughs> being in uh, good economy. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, the way you operationalize space. Absolutely. Meaning real space. Yeah, you can consider uh, space, we don't so much. Yeah, absolutely. You don't do space and you don't do real spaces. Uh, and I will get back uh, to this issue at the end because uh, we have uh, a possibility and I think that that is Tache reached out to you to propose it, that we're going to Brussels and with geographers in February and uh, we're doing work. and this is something all of geographers do, it works and a lot of you don't do, uh, meaning you don't go into real spaces and interview people and see how it's going. Such things are very central in geography, so this is important. Uh, I'm going to launch today the, the series of seminars. Uh, this series of seminars was born out of the uh, willingness will of both David Flashy and myself to make you economists more aware of ecological challenges. Because we did this review, the state of the art, and tried to see how many papers in economy were dedicated to ecology, and it's not a big amount, I must say, a very little amount, and you're one of the disciplines that has, been, that has been the most sheltered from the ecological issues. So that's something we want to challenge. And so we did create this major, uh, the major C, and also this list of seminars, and we did also create uh, uh, a GDN, Joint Doctoral Network, and we will, uh, we will recruit 11 PhD on this topic in between ecology and geography, ecology, geography, and economy. So, meaning that's something we devoted to do. So, I've been uh, teaching in this uh, special Erasmus Mondu since some years now, so I am more, more used to the view of economy than I was at the start. And that's why I insist on field work. This is something for those who want to do the master thesis with me, field work is something quite important. And I feel, and I have told that to David also, that you don't have enough insights in methodology regarding field work. And that's something also I will, uh, I will on, uh, on the line. I am also the director of the Center for Earth Politics. This center was created in 2019 uh, in Paris, in between Sciences Po, this university, Université Paris-Cité, and the Institute of Global Physics. This is a multidisciplinary institute it with physicians, climatologists, geographers, anthropologists, science, uh, political science. And we're working on these issues in the center. And right now we, we're preparing a full school uh, next year, which will be in between Max Planck Institute, uh, Humboldt uh, University, this university, and Oslo University dedicated to this issue. Uh, and so that's something that's very important for us, and especially in France, a big program of research is going to be launched on this, uh, on this theme. So, uh, if you go, I'll show you afterwards. So, what we call habitability, uh, 
some people have been translated this term in uh, English by liability, which is another way of saying it, uh, is because there are more and more ecological disasters. Uh, it's not very... And there are also a cumulative impact of this ecological disaster, which may render the Earth totally inhabitable. Uh, in plenty, plenty of spaces and places of the Earth. So, what we're trying to define is what are the limit conditions of the habitability of Earth. You know, there are thresholds where it won't be possible anymore to live in certain countries, in certain regions, and certain places. For example, in Paris, uh, if you take Paris as a city, it's one of the deadliest of 284 cities that have been studied in the case of growth, of heat, of heat wave, because a lot of people do die, and one of the conditions to, 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 to make it more livable or to more habitable is to uh, because it's very, very hot by summertime, uh, and uh, especially during the, the, like two weeks ago, it was like around 37, but if you touch the ground, for example, if you swim and touch the ground, we're near 60 on the ground. I mean, because uh, the, the asphalt absorbs heat, and, you know, <coughs> there are certain mechanisms. So that makes it very deadly. So, this habitability will be a mix of mitigation and adaptation strategy uh, within planetary boundaries, okay? And for me, uh, the habita one point which is very important, the habitability of Earth is not only uh, graspable or you can't only tackle this issue uh, through art science, meaning uh, uh, biology or ecology or climatology, we need political choice and we need economical choices. And that's why I am the, the director of the Center for Earth Politics because it is a center which is driven by uh, social sciences <coughs> and not by hard sciences. And that's kind of uh, an originality, you could say. Uh, so you can find the paper online, uh, it's both in English, this paper, uh, we've published it, it's both online in English and in French, it's free, you can go on the site of the, of the Center for Earth Politics, you just uh, type down Center for Earth Politics or in French, uh, Centre des Politiques de la Terre, and you'll find the paper online. So just two words again uh, for the word of habitability. Uh, so in the field of social sciences, it was mainly used uh, by anthropologists and geographers because they studied the way people were inhabiting places throughout history. Uh, all kind of studies, it could be how uh, housing was done or center of, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, uh, les centres de peuplement, uh, how population centers. Population, centers. population center, yeah, maybe. And, uh, uh, and so in geography, in anthropology or in sociology, Bourdieu has done a great work about it. Uh, especially in the northern part of Algeria. And uh, we did study how humans did uh, uh, people in some places. On the same time, in the same time, uh, the notion of habitability was used by physicists and biologists, especially to study what were the limit conditions of certain planets, for example, Mars, Venus, and other planets and to see why these planets were not inhabitable anymore. Uh, and there are certain studies which show, I have uh, read this painter lately, a major scientist at the origin, that Mars was inhabited at the time by kind of bacteria, 
uh, and the way Mars and the planet Earth evolved separately showed that there were certain conditions that were not fulfilled on the planet Mars uh, that, uh, that were fatal to this planet habitability. So, as you all know, the planet has been under pressure all the 20th century. I won't go uh, in much detail a bit afterwards, but that's not. And we have this key report in 1972, I think you all know about it. Okay, that's good. The Meadows report. Uh, and do you know this, uh, this report has been actualized in last year, I think? Did you see the report? And do you know about... I, I, I will... Uh, I won't have time today, but we will talk uh, uh, about it uh, later. Uh, Earth for All. Do you know this program of research? Yeah. Okay, that's good because I, I would like, uh, eventually we could discuss what's in it and how do you, what do you think of it. And how it goes back, what does it introduce and, uh, and such. Okay, so... So I, I will go fast. Explosion of human activity, you all know that, I guess. I don't know how much you know, depending on where you come. So it's like, uh, uh, there is a paper which was quite important in France. This is the Atlas of the Anthropocene. Uh, and they have created plenty of maps showing how the pressure on land use was, uh, uh, was uh, growing since the... Uh, 18th century and such. So it's interesting to see how it is specialized. Once again, I am a geographer. And it's not only a question of number, but also a question of spaces. Because if you talk about inequalities, inequalities will have to do, when you talk of the earth inhabitability, very much with land views and different spaces and regions. Um, so this is a new map, on the, on a recent map on the pressure of land use. But you can find it, I think, online, these maps, in the Atlas of the Anthropocene. It was uh, publicized a lot. So you have heard of this report. This was like mathematical modeling at the time. And Earth Hall is not so much on based on mathematical modeling, but it also introduced more qualitative research so, and political science. So that's uh, kind of important. And also because this report uh, in uh, 1972 uh, was an effort in terms of uh, modeling of complex systems. <coughs> and that was quite new to see how the interaction and retroaction and complex loop uh, were going on. So two persons at the origin, uh, the Melamidos and uh, husband, uh, and this very well-known uh, schema, schema diagram uh, showing how the pressure <coughs> on resources is big. And this is also, uh, uh, I can give you this uh, slide too afterwards if you need it. Mm -hmm. So if I go too fast, um, uh, we can go back uh, to it at the end. Uh, but uh, but uh, so if I go too fast, you can me. And that was a systemic vision, meaning a vision of the socio-ecosystem before its time. This is uh, an advance in terms of uh, complex uh, thinking, especially when you introduce uh, not only a natural system, but also population, industrial capital, and such. But once again, this report is very easy to find online, and it's quite interesting if you do some uh, uh, history of epistemology, uh, just to see how the history of ideas has been going. I mean, I find that quite, quite inspiring. So this one you know, uh, Krebsen. Uh, Krebsen was a chemist. That's what's interesting, uh, and you find them 
and finding that in plenty of centers like the one I am the managing director of, meaning that it's a chemist who thought about the Anthropocene, who coined the word Anthropocene, and even though it was mostly, uh, it concerned mostly geology, uh, because it was a new geological era, or it was supposed to be, geology of mankind. I must say that uh, it was discussed mostly by social and human sciences. I mean, that was, uh, there was, that this term of Anthropocene uh, 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 created a vast turmoil in the, in the field of uh, social sciences. Uh, so, and this guy was uh, laureate of the Nobel Prize of Chemistry. Uh, so, it's very much a uh, hard science. Another, another thing which is very important, uh, I don't know if you know this report as well. It was one which was co-written by Arma, Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen with the, the Nobel Prize of Economy in 2010. No. And, yeah, I think it was 2010, I'm not sure. 11, maybe. Well, and uh, so what it showed, and the team showed, is how much uh, human well being depends on the quality of ecosystem functioning, of the quality of ecosystem functioning. And I am very accurate about that because. Usually people think of ecosystem as a stasis, and I'm not talking about stasis, the state of an ecosystem, I'm talking about the functioning. Meaning how much, uh, for example, a tree is exchanging with the soil, which is exchanging with the subsoil, which is exchanging with the air, which is exchanging with the whole environment. So never take living being as uh, cut out of its environment, an ecosystem is a, must be considered as a, a system of function, functioning. Uh, and so it showed that uh, a lot of our well-being depending on them, and especially the well-being of poor people. The more deprived were people, the more we were, were dependent on their ecosystem, especially in southern countries or in places where they did need wood outside, they did need to gather food, they did need uh, grass for their, for their cattle or things like that. So it's, uh, and they gave birth to this, uh, to this uh, scheme where you can see the ecosystem services on one side and the constituents of well-being on the other side. Uh, and so they showed these people, this team, that uh, for all kinds of reasons, and not only food, uh, but health also, or good social relation, and uh, personal safety, that we need uh, this kind of, uh, we need this good uh, function, uh, functioning of the ecosystem. So, and this scheme at the start was very different, I, I forgot to translate this slide, but it doesn't matter, I will uh, tell you. Uh, this modeling of the start of the 70s was very different of what we showed through the planetary boundaries. At the start, we showed how uh, the, the complex system of natural resources, uh, population and such were functioning. And now, and how much pressure we put on the Earth, on the Earth resources. And what is the difference with planetary boundaries? That do one can think about that between what it shows there that it didn't show at the time. It's a three penny question. No? Yeah? That we already transgressed the view of the boundaries? We didn't talk of boundaries at the time. In 70, we didn't talk of the boundaries. 
I mean, we talked about limits, but that were, that were, there were limits to resources, which is quite different. I gave you the key words, just three seconds ago, so, um, yeah. I mean, if, if I look at it correctly, then when we look at limits set by resources, they're, they're like constraints on how much resources are available to us to yeah. utilize. But planetary boundaries go one step further by saying that even if there are resources available, we can't use all of them because mm -hmm. using all the resources will still cross the boundaries set by the planet, like boundaries on the oxygen cycle or on the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle, which makes uh, everything around us habitable. And um, therefore, we need to think of planetary boundaries and then optimize our uh, resources in the sense that we can't even think of using all the resources that are available. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the boundaries are about ecological regulation, ecological functioning and regulation. So the boundaries are not anymore on resources, but even if the resources are available, I mean, we could transgress some, uh, some uh, ecological functioning. You wanted to intervene? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But uh, these boundaries are mostly quantified. I mean, uh, and that's part of the critique we can make to this kind of model. And there is also another critique we can make to that. It's the 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 um, uh, how these different boundaries do interact one with another, and that is not modelized yet, because it's very complex, yes? Didn't they like publish two days ago that they quantified all the boundaries now? Think not it's very all. New. The sixth one was transgressed. Okay. But uh, it's not better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so this, uh, and we'll see it, because, uh, yeah, this one. So 2009, three boundaries crossed. 2015, uh, four boundaries crossed, and in 2023, six boundaries crossed. So, and this is um, an effort to modelize the interaction between the different boundaries, meaning how the biodiversity erosion do is linked to the cycle, uh, uh, nitrogen cycle, for example, is linked to whatever. I mean, and they try to modelize all this interaction. It's very schematic right now. I mean, we have like sometimes uh, uh, numbers on certain types of interaction, but we can't have the whole. I mean, it's very complex. It's why I tell you a full Sometimes it looks very much like wishful thinking. I mean, in terms of uh, scenario, uh, uh, scenario, scenario. And uh, because we don't know yet uh, how much of this interaction will be deadly. I mean, we have plenty of uh, uncertainties. So, and the last one to be transgressed in, uh, in uh, 2023 is the water, so, uh, uh, sweet water, uh, green water, I can't remember how we call it, fresh water. Fresh, water. Fresh, water. fresh water. So it's like we, we're not faring better, we're faring uh, more and more progressively deteriorating our environment. So, uh, there was a paper on these issues. I can uh, send it to you, give it to you. That was a very recent paper three days ago. But if you type on Google uh, six boundary transgress, you will find it, I mean, I think. Uh, and one of the co-authors was Oxfoma. So I think you will find it. Uh, and then it is detailed in the paper, but I won't go into that and give you all these numbers. It's why I'm telling you it's not so much uh, qualitative. I mean, I would say you would talk much more on the, of the interaction between the different boundaries. That would be more qualitative, I think. 
I mean, uh, and right now it's just, you know, box after box. It's, uh... Okay. Uh... So, One thing that is very important to say, and that's where the geography, the geographer gets in again, is this phenomenon, the, for example, the erosion of biodiversity, uh, the, even the climate change, or different, uh, or different phenomena like that, are not equal all over Earth. Maybe you know already that, uh, for example, in Europe, the climate change is uh, four times faster than elsewhere. I mean, we're eating, for many geographical reasons, we're eating very much faster. Uh, so all these processes have geographical issues. Uh, it's, uh, the erosion of biodiversity can be very lo local. For example, if you think of an island, uh, you know there is the phenomenon of uh, on appelle ça un isola biologique, uh, of uh, the phenomenon of the island regarding uh, life evolution. So you can have all kind of uh, autonomous space regarding the erosion of biodiversity, but you can have also uh, global collapse. So if you look at that, you need to be taking a lot of geography. Uh, and especially if you talk about transition, you can't tell about a global model. I mean, uh, it, it, it won't go like that. And you need, uh, especially if you want to, uh, to do research and research action and try to engage people and especially stakeholders to come with you, to be with you on board. I'm right now working with the city of Paris and trying to see how they can match uh, the, 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 the climate change plan and popular classes issue, uh, as, uh, we need to go at the local level because otherwise we just uh, don't have the necessity of such global model. Also, there is a question of space and there is, and we will see later on, the question of social classes. I mean, uh, as you know, the, the inequality and justice issue is, is being taken more and more into account, that's good, but we need to be very careful that it's not just a wishful discourse, uh, because uh, as I saw in many places, if you say, well, what kind of study do you have regarding popular classes and climate change, popular classes and waste issue or whatever, you will find that there are no, not so many, uh, so many uh, studies. Uh, okay, so, and one thing also is this concept of uh, planetary boundaries has become more and more uh, popular in Europe. For example, there are cities like Amsterdam, we, not Paris so much, but uh, cities that have, that have been using this concept, trying to apply it to their region, to their city, to the local level. This is France. For example, these are the planetary boundaries. This is the global issue, and this is the French issue. You know, for example, climate change, both the global, uh, the global uh, the global and the uh, French, French uh, boundary of climate change uh, has been uh, transgressed, but uh, ocean, for example, is uh, France is much more concerned by ocean because uh, thanks to its colonial history, it has a lot of seas, and uh, so it should. Uh, take into account much more of its history if it wants to be uh, in the thresholds of planetary boundaries. Uh, it's the same for fresh water. I mean, uh, France has a lot of issues regarding fresh water, which is not so much at the time of this uh, diagram, which was uh, written in 2019. 
uh, that was not so important uh, regarding the global issue. So you can see how it applies. Uh, there are plenty of maps, and this says this is this says a big consequence. Uh, and I will show you later. If you take the map of France of any of your country, uh, you can see that all regions are not equal. And meaning, if you have uh, a tax. Uh, should you tax more one region than the other regarding the water uh, or regarding uh, whatever issue you want to choose? For example, Brittany in France is all in red. So, I mean, it's, uh, and it's not so true on the east part of France. So what does it mean? Also, what does it mean in terms of insurance? I'm trying to reach out to you to economical uh, points because insurance right now it's mutualized at, uh, uh, at uh, big scales. But why should I pay in my insurance for people who choose to live near the sea, for example? Why should I pay for people who choose to live, I don't know, near uh, where climate change is being very dangerous? So there are plenty of issues like that that uh, should be taken into account and that involves geography. Uh, the critique we can have regarding that, and that was done very much by many scientists regarding planetary boundaries, was that the science of system Earth are still very young. And there are many, many interactions and uh, uh, complexities we enable to reach out to, really enable. I mean, it's like, uh, and also because planetary boundaries are very much an image. It's an image. It's like uh, if you're in a cockpit of a plane, you can see a lot of things for your cockpit, but it's not the real world. It's still a map, and a very very simple map. So it's good as a map, but never forget it's just a map. Uh, and also because you focus on top-down control uh, with this map, this global map, uh, and uh, we forget uh, who are the main stakeholders responsible for this state of the earth. I mean, and there are very entrenched industrial interests, as you can see in the media. Uh, and that's something we won't find again with just the planetary boundaries uh, map. I mean, that's something we have uh, to find new tools to fight again. Uh, okay, so I'll go fast, especially because uh, Nathalie de Noble will, uh, you will have afterwards, is a climatologist. Uh, so she will give you a lot of details and uh, she is part of the regional IPCC we created uh, and the network of uh, different uh, tools we created in order for regions and places to fight against uh, these issues. So this is one of the planetary boundaries. Yeah, I, I would like to say something about, so we planned out different seminars. Maybe you can find, you can pick a bit here, a bit here, but uh, biodiversity, IPCC, it's not the full picture. I mean, uh, it can seem to lack here and there of some data, but you can find them online also. It's just to give you a taste of, it's not a complete picture. Uh, especially because you are economist and uh, you have to dedicate most of your time to economical issues. But we wanted to make you aware of certain stakes uh, in our fields. Uh, and that's why you'll, get, you'll have a taste uh, or a peak of climate change, a peak of biodiversity erosion, and things like that, or global health. Antoine Flau is a uh, uh, the director of the Institute of Global Health will come also to talk to you about global health issues. But it's just a peak of things there and there. So, I mean, uh, if you want to go further, uh, either you reach out to 
different teachers or you go by yourself, but it's just, you know. Um, also, I want to say be, be careful about people who don't see the difference between meteorology and climatology. But maybe Natalie will talk to you about it. But it's part of the climatosepticism. Do you know the difference between meteorology and climatology? Focus on the short term weather, focus on the short term weather, the other on long term climate. Trends, it's statistics. The other one is uh, climatology, is very much, it, 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 it goes after 30 years that time range. Uh, so it's statistic, you're totally right. But uh, when people are cold, like this summer in France, I say, you see, the climate change didn't change. I mean, because uh, it will happen because it's still cold by summertime. So there is a big confusion in the term. So be careful of the term you're using and with whom you're talking. Because um, my friend, who are maybe Natalie, we've talked about it, uh, are in the field of climatology, are very much addressed uh, by people. I mean, every time I do this kind of conference in the uh, before uh, uh, public audience, uh, there is always someone in the audience who tells me that uh, and find a counter human saying that the climate change is not happening, it's not of the... So you have to be very careful about what you say and the consequences of what it means. So, okay, I want... Uh, And one other argument is the speed of change. For example, I have this friend, he's a top uh, notch uh, executive for Vivendi, or a big, big, big company. And uh, he told me, well, that doesn't matter, uh, that uh, the erosion of biodiversity doesn't matter because Macron said also the same thing. Was it Macron or someone like that? Because, you know, it happened five times before that the biodiversity crashed down and every time we just recompose. And they forget one thing, it's the, the amount of time we need. It was more than 10 million of years needed to recompose the biodiversity. So because it's on a small diagram, people think there is, that's why the image is very dangerous. And you have every time to specify that this time is a huge time, you know. It's not just uh, the time of, uh, of the life of a uh, human being. <coughs> so, and that's why we're talking about the speed of change right now, which is very deadly. Uh, okay, by university, I won't uh, go uh, very much into depth. By university, is essential. Uh, you won't find so many things on your table once there is no more insects. For example, I'm a specialist of uh, arthropods, which is a vast uh, range of insects and spiders and, uh, and such. And I work on the rewilding of cities. And working on the rewilding of cities, especially in schoolyards, I see how much people do dislike insects and arthropods and all that. I mean, it's very difficult. But if we don't have them anymore, we will suffer much more than just to look at the spider. I mean, it's like, uh, so you have to, well, put perspective in all that. Uh, I'm trying to, to convince the teachers to put uh, giant uh, images of this insect because I think that if we used to seeing them, it will be less frightening. I mean, it's just a question of scale, I think. Well, we'll see, anyway. So, this is an image, uh, and I think that uh, Luc Abadi, who is working on biodiversity, she will show you more images. Uh, this was a 99 person, 10,000 years ago, of wild animals, and now it's 67% of cattle and almost 1% of wild animals. I mean, if you talk uh, in terms of biomass. 
the mass of living beings at the surface of this planet. So, uh, I mean, it means that we converted all wildlife into cattle, somehow. Uh, okay, uh, so the biodiversity crisis, uh, I'll, uh, uh, this is a rhythm of disappearance of uh, wildlife uh, on the surface of Earth. And insects are very much disappearing. I'm always pleading for them. They're, they're so uh, much well known that the big mammals, for, for, for many reasons, and we need them much more than the lion, somehow. So, I mean, the okay, uh, so this is the rate of disappearance. Uh, and the estimation of the percentage of uh, species which, which are endangered. And once again, I mean, uh, uh, Luke will talk about that. Uh, some species are more important than others, but usually they're not the species we valorize for many reasons. I mean, because so we have to revise our cultural system regarding wildlife and what we valorize, how much it, it holds uh, the ecosystem. We, some species are called umbrellas, you know? Did you know this term of umbrella species? No? It means that some species are uh, sheltering other species because these other species do depend on the third species. So there is like a cascade, you know, of... Uh, so one species can determine an, eco an whole ecosystem. I mean, it's very important to see that. It's why the wolf, for example, is not the only... Uh, it's not only the wolf. It's also everything it brings with it, okay? And the vulture in India is disappearing. Do you know the vulture? Is that a good word? Vautour? The vulture is disappearing. And it's very, very bad. Because the vulture was uh, eating uh, the dead cows. And it was helping to decompose these dead cows into the ground, helping other species along the way and helping also, uh, and nowadays, if the dead cows do decompose and nobody uh, eats them, uh, it's going to pollute uh, the water underneath and everything like that. So you have always to think in terms of interdependency. Regulation, functioning, interdependency, these are, uh, to my point of view, key words. So, Pollination, this is uh, an example with insects, without insects. I mean, it's like two images. Uh, but once again, I'm working with students in art about ecological memory, uh, because I think that uh, generation after generation, we will forget that we used to eat like that. And we will get used to that, then that, then that. I mean, until, uh, you know, the, uh, do you know the metaphor of the boiling water for the frog? So that's ecological memory, most of uh, it. Okay, uh, also there was this study, effects of decrease of animal pollinizator on human nutrition and global health. Uh, this was a modeling analysis. Uh, and they saw that there were changes in rates of cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and diabetes, uh, infectious diseases. So you, it has many consequences. Uh, this study is, uh, you can find it online too. It was published in The Lancet, I think. It was published like the study about Paris and uh, the fact that we die much more in Paris than in Berlin, for example, uh, in case of heat wave. Uh, so ecosystem services. Do you know this platform, IPBES? Do you, do you know the IPCC, I guess? You yeah. have a full course on the IPCC, I But do you know this one? 
I P B E S. This is the, the, the same than the IPCC, uh, but for nature ecosystem services, international platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And like uh, the IPCC, they do full report every five years. Uh, they started later on, the IPCC was created in 1990, uh, and this one was created in 2010. And, uh, but they do full report, uh, exactly the same fun uh, functioning as the IPCC, and they do full report on the state of nature and biodiversity. Uh, they have a strong uh, geographical component, uh, which is uh, very interesting uh, to see. Okay, this is for France. The, the, the state of extinction of species uh, uh, all over France. And because it has like island like that, uh, or it has like that, like that, every one of these islands is, uh, it has a very strong rate of uh, extinction of species in France. I mean, uh, that's why France is not, uh, a good country to talk of that. So I, I'll, uh, I'll go very fast on two examples. Nitrogen. Uh, has any of you ever worked on the uh, biogeochemical cycle? No? Uh, can you tell me more about them? Do you know some of them? No? Yes? <coughs> um, they are a big part of like the wildlife and the exchange between uh, like in cellular uh, conception. <laughs> it's uh, well it's too bad it's too soon, yeah. Yes? Well uh, I what I remember is that nitrogen is essential for the growth of plants. Uh, uh, lately, humans have been synthesizing nitrogen to accelerate the, the rate at which they can uh, harvest. Uh, and that creates an all, all the problems, uh, mainly uh, when, they, when these um, fertilizers dissolve due to rain, they go to water bodies and they contaminate them. Also, phosphorus uh, has been widely disturbed uh, by the same reason. And well, the carbon is the, the also inherently related to phot photosynthesis. And, yeah. Absolutely. And do you know what is this contamination? When you say contaminate, you, what kind of mechanism do you describe? Uh, okay. There was you wanted to intervene, no? No. no. You. Uh, we have the, in the case of contamination with nitrogen, it's uh, effectively when it reaches. What is the water? It effectively leads to the formation of so much algae that breathe into oxygen and therefore they turn the, um, whatever body of water they're in, they turn it um, inhabitable for other animals that breathe. Like fish, so all the fish die and you have green ponds. So Absolutely. And we have uh, this problem in France, in Brittany, uh, because of the pigs. I mean, we have like 12 million pigs being raised in France, in Brittany, I think it's 11 million or 10 million, I can't remember the exact number, but a huge amount in very huge farms. I mean, the animals are treated like, I mean, it's like, a, and so the, the nitrogen goes into the groundwater, then goes into the sea, then kills the fish after being killed, everything in between, the fresh water, and then kills the fish, and then the fishermen come to us and say, well, we can't fish anymore here. That's what we're going to do this week. I'm leaving for Brittany and to make discuss uh, fishermen on one side and peasants or uh, pig, uh, pig raisers, pig breeders on the other side and, uh, and try to find a local, to create a local contract because if the fishermen can't fish anymore, 
They go in the re natural reserve to f be able to fish. So they just destroy the natural reserve because they need fish. So it is like this kind of cascade of consequences. And some people uh, did uh, write this comic book. Do you know uh, the comic book about green algae in Brittany? It's a bestseller in France. It's called green, uh, Les Algues Vertes, Green Algae. Uh, for those who read French, it's, uh, it was a bomb shell in France because this, this book was turned into a film. And uh, the, it was two women who wrote this book, a social scientist and a comic uh, designer. And it was uh, the product of a massive investigation, they did four years. And they denounced many stakeholders, among them the state uh, and the local state. And so they were very much threatened of death many times by local uh, peasants. Uh, and even the local state, I don't know how much it was compromised. And that was, uh, there was a film which was, uh, you, could see, you could see last week, and uh, that was a huge success in France. And it raised many questions, and that's the first time that, uh, I mean, the state decided, and there was a, a, a jury, a, a trial, uh, decided that it had to stop the process of the, and to examine the cycle of nitrogen in Brittany. So it's, it's just to give you some flesh, I mean, just not numbers, but life in different regions. Uh, yes? I think there's also a big regional part about it, because if I remember correctly, then a lot of the places where a lot of fertilizer is used are mainly those where nitrogen levels in the ground are very low, like in Brazil, for example, where a lot of the food products for cattle is planted. And so you extract nitrogen from the cycle there and bring it to places to feed the cattle in Europe or in North America where nitrogen levels are very high. Yeah. So it's a self-reinforcing cycle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And inequal. Inequalities are. So this is just an image to show you the cycle of uh, very good. And uh, there is, for those who like uh, uh, reality better than science fiction, you should look at the, uh, at the story, life story of the inventor of nitrogen. I mean, his name is Fritz Haber, Fritz Haber, and he was the one, it's a really strange person. I mean, he was born, I think, he, 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 he was part of the First World War, then he died before the second one. But he, he invented the gas sarin, which is a deadly gas which was used during First World War. Then he invented the nitrogen, and he had, and he had uh, the Nobel Prize for that. But he was Jewish, and he had to flee. But he was the one who invented the Zyklon gas, who led his whole family to the gas chamber. So it's a really uh, incredible story of, uh, of someone who believed in patriotism uh, and, and helped the, the growth of plants all over the planet with this invention of the extraction of the nitrogen out of the air to decouple, I mean, to double the, the growth of the population at the surface of the earth. So, you know, not neither white nor black in between. So, okay, so I think you know enough about nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, once again, uh, because I see uh, the time running. Um, so this is, for example, uh, nitrogen. Uh, so Britain is here. We have, we have a global uh, view of things, but nowadays we need to, uh, to go on a regional uh, view to be able to do more. So I will show, do you know that? This is a very interesting paper. Uh, it's called The Good Life Within Planetary Limits or Boundaries. Uh, this paper was published and reinforced by the 
uh, in 2018, uh, and they did put the different countries uh, on the on on the both an axis uh, and on um, So social thresholds achieved and biophysical boundaries transgressed on the on the. So here is Malawi, and France is here, Germany is up there, and uh, so the Netherlands, and United States is here, so meaning it transgressed much, much more biophysical uh, boundaries, and it reaches less social, uh, social, social uh, well-being. So, and uh, the donut, the safe space should be here. I mean, it's like, uh, you can find it online. Once again, it's a very, I think it's an interesting paper. It's not uh, as many papers that have been published. I mean, there are lots. I mean, uh, it's not complete. You can criticize it for this kind of paper. But it shows uh, interesting, uh, uh, in, in more details, things that uh, the Kate Roworth image. That's why it's the same than planetary boundaries. The donut uh, was very much uh, startling, but this kind of schema is more detailed, more precise, with uh, more data behind it. And they try to build uh, this kind of, for, for example, social support. 90% uh, of people have friends or families they can depend on and the uh, countries above threshold, among them where is the different countries. So all that is in the paper, equality, employment, these are the social thresholds, uh, access to energy, education, income, sanitation, healthy life, life satisfaction. So this kind is, uh, this table is important because these are the political and economical uh, choices. I mean, these are, these are, on the other side, uh, some uh, biophysical uh, boundaries. So I can give you the reference if you want, or you will have the... the uh, so as you know, if we want to achieve uh, the quality of life, I mean, yes, let me just say one word about this. Uh, as you can see, none of these countries achieve a high level of uh, quality of life without transgressing uh, a lot of uh, biophysical boundaries. I mean, none of them. Uh, this country, Vietnam, is a bit strange. I mean, because once again, there are question of data. And as you know, uh, all data are not so solid, depending who provides the data. So uh, it looks a bit strange. Uh, it should be checked out. I mean, I, I'm not sure it's at the right place. I mean, because there are so many <coughs> issues of pollution in uh, Vietnam, in deforestation, and things like that, so not so sure. Are there questions about that? So, well, we are far from perfection. This is good. Why are we <laughs> far from perfection? We, we're so far from perfection. Yeah. We're not aiming for perfection, I mean. Yes, we should. It's like, uh, so, what I wanted to say uh, is that inequalities, not only geographical and territorial, but also social inequalities, are at the start and at the end. This is my, what I would say, based on uh, my view on political choices, but also things I have been studying. Uh, so inequalities are the motor, the motor, uh, the machine, the hurt of consumption, uh, of social consumption, of uh, the way we behave one regarding another. 
And inequalities at the end, meaning that these inequalities have been reinforcing right now and will reinforce themselves moreover uh, because of climate change and because of the inequalities regarding the future quality of life in terms of planetary boundaries. So this is what we can call a vicious circle because the growth that we know of doesn't appear to hold the promises it was supposed to hold at the start. And we left with nothing except inequalities and a degraded earth. So we, I mean, this guy uh, who talks a lot about that, André Gors, he was a writer of the 60s uh, who worked with Illich, Ivan Illich, you might know of or certain of you might know of. And uh, he, he wrote great things and things which are very pertinent for today. Uh, I think it's sometimes very important to go back on writings and books that were written in the 60s and before in order to understand what's happening today. So growing inequalities, you have heard all about that, I think. Uh, at what time should I finish? I can't remember. Uh, I get up? Four. À 16 heures, donc j'ai encore une heure. Mais je voudrais qu'on discute. I'd like us to discuss. I'm very... Uh, I distrust myself because I am a talkative person. So I know how much I can talk. So... Okay, not only wealth inequalities, uh, but also inequalities regarding the contribution to climate change. Have you heard about these debates? All of you? Do you have the numbers in mind? I mean, in diff at different scales, for example, how, I mean, the contribution of rich people, of the one person, of the ten person, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some uh, scales. We, this is the contribution in the world. It's in French, I'm sorry, but uh, that was a PowerPoint uh, that I did for French public, so uh, I just translated it. Uh, so it was in 2019, the contribution to climate change by the 0.01% uh, zero, uh, uh, zero, the, the richest on Earth. So these are the numbers. These are the 50% of the poorest on Earth. And you can find it on the World Inequality Database. There is plenty of numbers regarding these issues, uh, which might be useful po for, for you. Uh, so Lucas Chancel, uh, who contributes to this data database, says that 771,000 persons do emit uh, 2,300 tons of equivalents of CO2 in 2019 when a person which belongs to the poorest majority emit only 1.4%. I mean, it's not only inequalities, it's just such a gap that goes much beyond, be, be beyond inequalities. So that's kind of a scale you can have in mind without having even the numbers, but I think it's uh, important. And you can find this database is actualized and they have done the same work, now this is the Banque Mondiale, uh, but uh, they have done this same uh, work for between countries. So the countries which emit a lot and have a lot of are rich countries, intermediary countries, and poor countries. So there is also a geography behind that, as uh, you might know. And these are the French persons. This is uh, you in France this year. So, uh, these are the richest, this one, the 10% the richest, 
This is by power uh, through 10%, 10%, 10%. Uh, and these are the poorest. But still the poorest, there are 50 tons, 0.2 equivalent per year, which is much, much more than any person in the in the poor countries. So, you know, and the uh, 10% richest, it's 40 tons equivalent. Uh, and this is the last one. Uh, well, this is a complicated schema. It's what kind of emission? Because uh, the ton equivalent carbon, you know that? Ton equivalent carbon, all of you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we put, uh, this is just an equivalent, so all kind of gas and all kind of emission are calculated like that. And this one tried to distinguish between the different type of contribution. Another, another work which is quite interesting, it's, uh, it was published in the Routledge Handbook of Climate Justice. Uh, this is thermal inequality. Uh, once again, it's a very special map. Do anyone can comment? Because I have no water and I'm dry. <laughs> I mean, if you want to get nearer, because it's maybe a bit small, no? located in the south hemisphere so they have like higher poverty levels and inequalities that make them more vulnerable and more unable to adapt so at the end it's a kind of reinforcement process yeah sure but it's uh, global distribution of population exposed to hyperthermia not only just a, a mix between humidity and uh, heat it's uh, so do anyone Yes. Yeah. Is our comment that we're on the relation between hypertermia and humidity? Yeah. Uh, because the way that the human body regulates heat yeah. speaks heat is through the evaporation of sweat. Yeah. So therefore, the higher the humidity level, the more difficult and slower it is the evaporation of sweat. Therefore, it's harder to lose temperature. When temperature gets too high with high humidity, it's called the wet cold phenomenon, and it's particularly particularly difficult for humans. Absolutely. You all know about this, so that's good. I mean, it's sad, but good. <laughs> but to comment on the inequality aspect of it, I think uh, what it tends to represent is that there are countries which contribute less to uh, increasing levels of heat and humidity uh, at a global level. But the population which is facing uh, hypothermia due to increased heat and humidity is more concentrated in countries which contribute less to it. I think that's the global problem in the world. Yeah, it is, in fact. And also, I mean, it doesn't, so, so this is a very global image, and depending on, on the scenario, as you can see, of the IPCC, so it's not. Uh, uh, it's not the same uh, regarding the different scenario, uh, but uh, yes? Uh, and it's also interesting to know how it's uh, related to the population density of the cities because usually because of inequality in these regions of the world, people have to be in more dense populated areas to find jobs and opportunities so they're more exposed to the risks of hypothermia in the, because of climate change at, at the same time. Uh, on the, on the, if you zoom on India, for example, uh, are many of you from India? One? Just one? Depending on, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, depending on the years. Uh, but uh, India seemed very at the crossings of many phenomena of global difficulties in the environment field. I mean, it's like you look at uh, it's like heat, humidity, <coughs> typhoon, and things, I mean, it's like 
And uh, I think cities will have to suffer differently. For example, Paris is not its surroundings. You can lose in between 6 and 10 degrees in the, between the center of Paris and the outskirts. So it's like it can be huge and, uh, and can lead to death and life uh, somehow, especially for people who are, uh, who are uh, uh, afraid. So, okay, uh, I have been studying this issue of local inequality since a long time, but uh, I didn't find it so documented online before 2010. If you try to Google it, urban climate justice, because I was much more focused on urban and cities, uh, you can see the peak of references drawing, uh, for example, urban climate justice on Scopus and stuff. There are like 11, um, 1,000 references. And among these 1,000 references, 900 of them uh, were in between uh, 2010 and nowadays. So it means that the issue of inequalities were not so much documented regarding that before 2010, and it's still growing. Uh, even like people like Hochstrom, who was very much an art scientist and not very well uh, documented on social sciences, to say the least. Uh, he has gotten more and more aware of this, uh, of this issue uh, of inequalities. And he published recently uh, with Gupta. Gupta is the one, uh, she's Indian, I think. She, she has uh, published the Earth Fall model. Uh, what? You mean Ghosh? Jake It's Gupta, no? George, you think? Oh, I can't remember. Whatever. Uh, let me. Might have the. I know I said Dixon Declare. Gosh, Rockstrom. Uh, I thought it was Gutta. Maybe I'm confusing with another paper. But uh, there were two papers which were published recently on planetary justice. So we're moving. What is very interesting to see is that at the start there was environmental justice, which was mainly documented by people in the States, United States, uh, uh, rationalized people, and who claim of a better quality of life through a better environment. Then there was climate justice, and it grew, grew, grew from 2000 two on the Bali summit until now, but that was mostly a justice from north to south. I mean, northern country against southern or vice versa. So that was a very global issue on climate justice. Then uh, there was uh, this uh, framework where very much discussed by people like Schlossberg, who might know of him. Schlossberg, David Schlossberg is an Australian. He published a lot of paper in, in between 2012 and 2017 on justice and tried to tackle the issue, how can we uh, envision this issue of justice in the future? Uh, so he talks about environmental justice, climate justice. And recently, these people did publish two papers on planetary justice. And so it, these are interesting papers to see how can we, because if we want justice on the earth, on this earth, we need to have a framework of reference. It's not only social justice, it's not only climate justice, it's not only uh, environmental justice. This framework don't work. They're not enough. Uh, so you have to think more widely in terms of justice and find new frameworks and just think beyond that. Uh, and what I am trying to do, I won't have much time to show you, but we're trying to see our mobilization throughout the world do move the framework of justice. 
When you bring gender issue, what do you bring? When you bring the justice for the bee, what do you bring in the framework of justice? When you claim for justice for the grass, the soil, what do you bring? I mean, how does it move? This framework of justice, which was very much born in a European-centered world in the 17th century. So I think we need to go further and think of this issue of inequalities and justice, not only in a descriptive way, not only showing that here are poorer people than here, but finding new ways of framing justice issue because it is a political view on what's at stake, from my point of view. So this is the map of Paris. As I told you, so justice issues is not only global stake, it's also local stake. Uh, so Paris is one of the most des deadly city when it comes to heat waves. And with a high intensity urban heat island, uh, and it means more for people who don't have enough money to get out of the city they with it, you know. Uh, so in, as I told you, in 2021, there was a 10% difference uh, between uh, the, 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 the center and the outskirts. So, and you can find uh, where are the richest, so the richest green, Okay, and you can find where it is the coolest also. And these are places where the richest are, and it is the coolest. So this is, a, I mean, it's more than a descriptive map because we're trying to match access to environmental security somehow, or ecological security, and uh, uh, social equality or inequality. It's not an easy map, not very well drawn. It's not me, it's my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> very courageous. But uh, it gives you, and this, this poorer places, third poorer neighborhood of France, it's also the least uh, related to green spaces and there are plenty of motorways and so you see there is like a really in terms of environmental justice there is a link in between the disparity of, ri of richness and the disparity of access to environmental goods and it's also where the game for olympics will be so, and what do you think they're doing? I mean, they're just uh, expelling people? Yeah, you wanted to intervene? No, I have a question, but finish your book, because it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, if they green these spaces, what they're doing for the Game of Olympics, and they expel people, except, and they put them further away, and they say, well, we need to renovate the city, so we'll uh, do something. I mean, I don't have time to organize a visit, but we could, you could ask David. He's uh, <laughs> not busy enough, I think. And uh, it's interesting to see the change of the city in these places where the Game Olympic is supposed to take place. We will have a study with a colleague who is very uh, politicized to see uh, uh, in terms of environmental climate justice how the Game Olympics played a role locally speaking and we will study all kind of mobilizations uh, to see how they take into account this climate and environmental I justice issues. Uh, Okay, this is just to give you some things that will not be addressed during your study here, but I could have done it, but uh, I won't do it. So, uh, so my work is I mainly focus these last years on the link between mobilization and social and social 
engagement on inequalities and justice issues. Uh, we will have a big colloquium in May, June with Future Earth, uh, which is a big think tank, international think tank. And we'll come uh, strong stakeholders of poverty issues like Ate des Carmons, des Maus, and all these people. Trying to see how all these people who have to tackle poverty on a daily basis, especially with students, because students are very ill treated here, not only here in France, but I guess elsewhere too. And this summer you could find students like you less lucky than you uh, being in line for popular soup. I don't know what you say. Um, soup populaire. Uh, because uh, students don't have enough money just to have free food meal. So, and these people, this mobilization, they do take into account more and more uh, inequalities. And that's what I study. I mean, I don't have time to go in depth in this study, but uh, just to tell you this is an important issue, it's also because uh, this kind of stakeholders and mobilization, they will have, uh, they play a major role in bringing on the, in the public debate these issues. I mean, without them, the government are just silent, mostly. So. When it comes to political debate, in many European countries, pro-climate mitigation policies are uh, usually voted in by richer people. Absolutely. Why? What is your analysis of this? Why do you think that, it, that poor people don't uh, yeah. vote for, for climate related policies? Uh, why, do you why, why do you think, what are your hypothesis regarding that? What do you think? And it's uh, the story of the Socialist Party, not only in France, but why do poor people do not, do not get what, do not vote for their own well-being in the future? I mean, uh, this, is, this was a vast issue in the 19th century and elsewhere. I mean, and how do you understand this? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ask a question. This yeah, is no, a, no, I really uh, thought uh, that I want to hear you. <laughs> Do anyone has one? Yeah? Like many reasons. First of all, like since they're, like they don't have time to think. They have only like a couple of uh, things in mind and it's like to work, to like s sort out the daily ba base things, you know? Second of all, like they, I don't know in Europe, but in many other countries such as Mexico, Latin America, I come from Mexico, like normally, um, they tend to go like they believe in this meritocratic uh, dream, and if like if they work and if they, like work, like hard enough, they will become like Bill Gates or you know like one of the richest. So they like because it's really hard like for poor people to act like acknowledge that they will never have the opportunity. As them, you know, and it's very like they would prefer to believe in the dream rather than something else. Like those are only two explanations, but I think it's way more complex. I, I think it's um, quite in the opposite direction. I think rich people tend to vote for a climate policy, and poor people tend to pay the price. Uh, or an example, I think is um, things like um, taxing. Um, heavily taxing fuels. That basically means that poor people can't have a car. It doesn't mean that rich people cannot. So the way that most climate policies end up working, they just uh, end up um, negatively affecting, at least in the short term, of course, negatively affecting the poor people and uh, people who not, do not live in cities at the same time as they benefit the uh, rich urban Are there other reasons? Are there feminine voices? <laughs> yes? Uh, what I can say, it's like mainly the, I think the upper classes, they do kind of a silencing of the poor people who need at the same time, because I think it's perceived that poor people can give more throughout climate change proportionally compared to a rich person, and they have to bear the cost. If you pick up, for example, in the case of Olympics, 
probably these people they are suffering with it with for a long time. They may be complaining, but they are perceived as they don't are qualified enough to talk about it. And just when rich people start to feel the consequences of climate change, they start to think, okay, we have to change this kind of thing. Uh, because this kind of situation, it happened in Rio, for example, when we had the Olympics, the same thing happened. We removed people from their <laughs> location. And it were like people that were living in really poor conditions, always complaining. And they were just thought about when they have a big event coming up, when rich people are interested where they are going, where the Olympics are going to happen. So it's kind of this power relation that's kind of something that uh, also interfere how poor people speak, how the power of poor people to talk and to, to act. It's limited by the rich people willing to pay for it somehow. Are there other comments? Yes? yes. I, okay, I, I take that point from the question. Yeah, can you speak louder? Because the question was about voting, right? So it was about intent, it was not about the consequence. So I'm not sure if this and this is what she asked, even though it's uh, What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> that was her question. Why do poor people not vote on it? For their own well-being. No, but like, if you're not hurt, why are you going to vote for something that you know that you're not going to change? No, but I mean, at, I don't know, at least in my country, uh, <laughs> this, the issue is politicized, mm -hmm. but people from lower classes tend to vote against uh, climate policies because of the way that it is politicized. So I think there is something wrong about the narrative and I'm, I'm trying to understand and study. Yeah, I think I think people vote in the Netherlands, but I think it happens in... Yeah, I think, like, for Russia. example, in case of Brazil, lots of poor people, they stand outside this discussion because mm -hmm. they know if they enter, they're going to be silenced. They, okay. they don't have a yeah. voice to do so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. they don't do it. You wanted to say, to add to it? But what do you think of intergenerational justice? I mean, and moral issues, <laughs> we moral it's beings. It's still related to, uh, at least in India, uh, it's like a very noticeable uh, phenomenon that a lot of times uh, people from humbler backgrounds and from uh, low income classes are considered more present biased because uh, they have a limited income, they have some urgent needs that they need to fulfill, they need to take a rent, they need to get internet for their children's education, they need to get food, maybe they have a small car or a two-wheeler and they need to manage fuel for it, and that exhausts their income. So they don't have much scope to deal with things beyond that. And I think that kind of also addresses the idea of intergenerational standard of living, because um, at least in like families in I, I live in New Delhi, which is not the you know the average city in India because it's we it's the national capital. It's got a lot of privilege surrounding it, and even in cities like New Delhi, it's very noticeable how families change from one generation to the other. In my case, for example, like I you know nobody in my family went to a college abroad. My parents went to college, but I they never went abroad for education or for business or things like that. Before them, my, my grandparents never went to college, they, they finished middle school, they didn't go to high school, they didn't do anything more than that. So I think in, in terms like these, it's very much related to how your standard of living changes with every passing yes. generation. But, and, and that is directly related to how you perceive it. Issues like climate, issues like healthcare, issues like well-being. Because the more aware you are, the more access you have to education, to, to public services, the more you realize that life can also be comfortable. You know? It doesn't need to be an everyday struggle. It doesn't need to be an optimization on an everyday basis about how to manage food. It can also be about, hey, we're feeling too hot. We should probably be concerned about it. Yeah, 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 there is one term, I, I, I mean, there are many reasons you all right, I think. I mean, you all right or wrong, I don't know, but all <laughs> these reasons can be debated. I mean, that's true. But I didn't hear the word media, mediation. I mean, that's just a remark. Yes? I would have said that, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised it didn't come on the table, because 
it's a strong stakeholder right now. I mean, the way it is politicized is not just dependent on persons. It's also the media ideology. I mean, uh, are there more comments? I mean, this is a, I, I can't answer your question more specifically than what you did. I mean, my view on that, it's a capture of power by certain people who have certain interests and not interest to listen to other people from other classes. So, so I am very much uh, Gramsci uh, hegemonie culturelle. But <laughs> once you said that, I'm no, I mean, there are multiple reasons, yes? Yeah, I think talking about the part where uh, people of poorer income classes have a very short-term um, analysis of things, I think this actually um, ma ma makes it even harder for climate change um, or, for cli or for climate mitigation policies and so on, because usually they are more costly in the short term before they become better in the long term. Take renewable energies, for example, they are generally much cheaper um, than, uh, than fossil fuels, but the transition towards them is costly and is a lot of upfront investment. I think it's especially this uh, problem that climate change in the short term is costly and creates uncertainty, um, and only the benefits come in the long term is why this perception and the nature of climate change mitigation policies is kind of counteracting each other. It's, uh, it's, uh, and I think this is why um, climate change policies must be accompanied with creating more equality or putting the burden of transition, especially on higher income classes that can deal with high upfront cons costs in the short term and, not, uh, and de thereby creating some more certainty for lower income classes that are scared of um, being more impoverished in the short term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know if I believe in taxes anymore. <laughs> uh, I, yeah? And just to add on uh, the reality of uh, the poor people not being able to make a choice. So in the Philippines, um, it's uh, prevalent the phenomenon of vote buying. So obviously, uh, if you accept money in exchange for your vote, that's uh, that's one of our realities about being very short term, you know. So you are being robbed even of your uh, democratic right to choose uh, progressive. We're not even actually talking about environmental challenges in the Philippines. It's more what's right or wrong. Because like, as maybe some of you know, my, my country voted the son of a former dictator. So it's like the challenge is even, uh, it's just evil or good. We're still at that basic uh, debate. And then second is the reality of when you care about the environment, what is the what are the challenges being faced by environmental activists? They are being killed. Yeah. So it's the it's the safety also of the people. Are are we safe to choose for our future? So the answer is one, we cannot afford it, I will exchange my vote. And second, it's not safe for me to fight for my land, for my for my future, for my generation. So the answer is no. No, I get it done. At this point, when we're talking about um, democracies in the global north, because I, I do think that the conditions are completely different yeah. uh, elsewhere. I think this is a very, very interesting issue. I mean, it's yeah. important to have this kind of debate. I don't know if you, you can organize one day a debate like that and trying to see what are the different uh, arguments. And because one thing I hear not in new talk, but in many talks around this table, is poor people shouldn't be considered as guilty of not voting the right thing because they're too poor to be intelligent, or smart, quiet <laughs> regarding the future. Yeah. And that's a very privileged um, view, a very um, biased view. I mean, a, a way to construct the non-rational thinking. I mean, and she answered regarding Philippine very well regarding that because that's why we have to be very, very accurate. I mean, try, and that's why we do field work because when you do field work, you realize how 
mingle the uh, complex issues of, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, I just wanted to add that people don't know what because they primarily ma make money from nature resources. Mm -hmm. um, so, if they would, they'll have to sacrifice the, the, the stream of income they are getting, especially, you know, to have more ecological. But uh, in the case tradition. being, I mean, you say economic tool, okay? But you very well know, because numbers are on the table, that uh, we will uh, get less rich collectively and individually speaking because of the environmental crisis. So, I mean, you can see there is somewhere uh, the, economic, uh, the ecological crisis bring on the table the fact that we're not rationally driven. And that's something that we have to deal with wondering, I mean, this was very much a thinking since the uh, 18th century. Human beings can be rationally driven and they can act for their own good. And if we show them through education what is the best way to behave, they will behave in the best way in order to. And you see collectively that people are just going directly in the wall. In French, you say, uh, going to confront the wall. And we have difficulties to think of arguments to explain why. I mean, what is the risk? Why do we keep going in the wrong direction, even though we have all the arguments, we have the science and everything? And it's not only the poor, I mean, they don't vote again. I mean, why do the rich do it? Why do the middle class like us do it? I mean, and that's something we have to, that need to be debated. And so I have, we, we, I won't go, this is one of the studies I did on the versus of justice versus mitigation versus adaptation justice issue. But I won't have time, so, okay. Uh, and this is not because, uh, and this, to, to talk about collective action, this, I, I was a researcher, I published two papers on the Citizens Climate Con uh, Convention. And there were like 150 people who participated. There were, uh, comment on dit, tiré au sort? Uh, randomly selected. What? Randomly selected. Randomly selected, yes. So there were people who didn't even, were able to, were not able to read. So uh, all kind of people. And the engagement regarding ecological issue was massive afterwards. So that says something about our capacity to get engaged on this issue, all classes uh, being together. Uh, and so you could also wonder uh, and do field work, wondering why there is such a uh, polarization of the political debate and between classes, but because this was uh, a mixture of all kind of people, and that was uh, kind of interesting to see how they got all engaged. Do you know this? Yes. Yes, you studied it? No. Not. <laughs> no, but you looked at it. So it's an interesting map. Uh, the work of uh, Martinez Allier is a very interesting work. Uh, these are all conflicts. It said in the international level, uh, so this is only France because uh, I just focused on France, but you can find all countries. It's only documented uh, by uh, you know a, a pool of uh, of, uh, of academics. So it's not all conflicts. It's not all issues. It's partial, but it gives you an idea of the type of conflicts and uh, people, where people do feel deprived of something and how they do react to this deprivation and extractivism. So, okay. So I will give you, to finish, I will give you a, a, a brief run on uh, the courses. So this was the introduction. I tried to, to show you 
how natural issues or social natural issues are mixed with equalities and justice issues because this is for me an important issue. I don't think that many of my colleagues will go back on these justice issues because they don't work on that. Maybe in the joint seminars, I think that Edouard Laurent will talk about just transition a bit because he is working on Brussels on this topic. But uh, that uh, can be, that can be, he won't treat it frontally like that. So, well, there won't be any calls regarding this issue this year, but uh, today. There is one course on climate change and one course on biodiversity. These are the two main pillars of uh, the ecological uh, crisis. And we decided with David that we focused on that. Uh, and then there are specific issues uh, because uh, the speakers seemed important. Uh, for example, social metabolism, you, I think after Vienna, for those who, of you who were in Vienna, you must uh, mm -hmm. have heard about social metabolism, uh, and uh, he will talk of that. This girl, Anne Lestrat, and she will tell you adapting water management model to face water crisis. She was uh, very important in Paris at the City Hall. She was the one who, uh, the water in Paris was managed by private uh, corporation, and she was powerful enough to re-municipalize the management of water. And since then, it is a public issue to water. So uh, she is, she was, uh, and now she is a consultant, and she's, uh, he is a very powerful figure Damien Carême, uh, beyond, uh, uh, amongst the uh, ecologists, and is a European deputy, uh, and he was uh, very much. He was one of the first in his northern, in the northern part of France. He, he, he was the mayor of a very small municipality, but he fought for, for taking into account the ecological crisis. And now he fight very much on migrants' issues and being widely open to different migrants. So you will discuss, he is a very courageous uh, person. This climate change comments and radical democracy in Europe. We met this group, uh, among them two women, as they are the forefront of this group, and they did this study throughout Europe of radical municipalism and how to change the way we build politics uh, at the local <coughs> state. And we're trying to do it in Paris. Um, this is my political engagement. Mm -hmm. And I met these two girls for that, and they did this very tremendous work at the European scale. You will have an intervention on the nuclear. This is a, a, a big issue in France. 75% of our electricity, or is it 80% uh, of our electricity comes from nuclear plants. So we, the nuclear nation. I mean, uh, it's like, uh, this guy, Fabien Esculier, is a wonderful person. He's a technician, which is a higher, and he works on toilets and uh, peace and he tries to convert the peace of Parisian into something that can fertilize the grounds without adding any nitrogen or anything in it. And he has, as a technician, as an engineer, he has created the special toilets, and he will talk about that. And why did I propose him? Because he is a very engaged scientist, and he tries to do, to be, he is a great scientist, and he tries to bring his science to concrete issues and transform you know, our ways of living. And it's called the Okapi program, and it's very important. This lady, Isabel Hélène Camp, she is a specialist of uh, feminist uh, agroecology in Brazil. Uh, and she She's a socio-economist, so she will be, uh, talk will be more familiar, perhaps, than the one of, uh, 
of uh, the ecologist or the climatologist. And she works very much on social provisioning. I don't know if you know this concept. And she works on that. Uh, and the work is very interesting in a feminist perspective, but not only. Antoine Flau will talk of Global Elf. Uh, is a is a physicist, you say? No, a physician himself. And then the last one will be, will be about the IPCC and its making, the making of the report. So the classes, you have everything about it. You have the calendar online, you can find, so that should be good. And last but not least, I have two things more. This thing, okay. Uh, this is how we will assess uh, participation to this course. Uh, I want to talk of engagement. Uh, so I am, as I told you, the director of the Center for Earth Politics. All the seminar is dedicated to engagement. What is engagement? What does it mean to engage oneself as a scientist, as a woman, as a whoever you want to be, as a cockroach, because I studied cockroach very much. So I'm a very, very engaged animal. So, and uh, so, I, 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 I don't know if David sent it to you, the way, no, no, he didn't. So, okay, uh, this is a deep uh, translate, so it may not be the best translation of what I wanted to say. Uh, the idea is we see engagement as necessary because of public inaction. Uh, it's true that our government are not up to the task uh, facing us. Uh, so there are all kinds of engagement, all kinds of commitments. It can be judicial, it can be scientific, it can be whatever you think. But how does it modify a person or, or a collective? But because it does modify its identity, but not only its identity, its environment. The idea is to be efficient. Uh, uh, and the idea is to explore that, collectively speaking, uh, as, uh, and we will have a public debate, public in between us, I mean, uh, and groups. Uh, and so I would like you, not by big groups, I mean groups like two, three, four at the max, I mean, uh, in order, you know, at the end, that will be generally uh, to expose a case of engagement, to discuss a case of engagement, uh, and to discuss how it was transformative. I mean, uh, you can pick whatever case study you want, but you will need to have it <coughs> very well in mind in order to show how transformative it was. Not only because uh, there are three trees uh, more on the ground, but also because it transforms the person who did who engaged themselves through this. Uh, so I, I, I want very much uh, part of the context of engagement. Uh, for example, I, I work with artists also, and I want to see how art. Uh, is part of the engagement, but it's not uh, mandatory for you. But uh, when I discuss with them, I say, well, what is socially transformative art? Uh, and how does it change? Uh, and how can it be replicated? I mean, what does it mean uh, if I launch tomorrow uh, a new course somewhere? How can I replicate its success? And uh, so, um, you can also <coughs> uh, fabricate the case study if you want, if you want to build up a story of engagement, but you need to make it very detailed in order to be credible and also to be interesting, I guess. Uh, and so you will uh, realize a poster, uh, an affiche, a poster, and so, and for example, in this classroom in January, uh, we will uh, uh, put all posters everywhere and we will go and you will discuss in front of the rest of the classroom 
uh, how did you see this engagement, what does it mean, and we can discuss what is needed to make an engagement efficient or fruitful, and not even efficient. <laughs> is that clear? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, and uh, this is ESM to you. Uh, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah. No, I'd just like to make a comment. I'm yeah. going to be talking about the, new, the French nuclear program. Okay. And I wanted to reassure everybody in the room that the spirit of what I'm going to talk about is very much in line with what you've been telling me. Okay. <laughs> so you'll be assured. <laughs> And these are school territories. Okay, this is you part of a master class, and I teach in other masters, and one is um, a mixture of geography and ecology. And we do field work, we do collective field work. So we're going to Brussels because you have a, I have a, I am a scientific responsible for a European program on the rewilding of school uh, in four European cities. And so with the, the other master, we're going to Brussels. It's a command, an order of the Brussels uh, urban community, uh, you know, the white Brussels. And they want us to study something. I mean, to study how good is the rewilding and stuff like that. Uh, so I can, it will be in February, we will stay in between uh, 10 and 15 days there in Brussels. Every expand is being uh, paid for. So, I mean, the trip and then uh, the food and the lodging. Uh, but it means we want to work with geographers and, uh, and ecologists and also to be able to work in French because uh, uh, the Brussels uh, stakeholders uh, that will be in French. So if you're interested to be part of it, just come to me and tell me and we'll make you part of the loop. Uh, the date of the field work, January 29 to February 9. Uh, these are the main question. I can send it to you. And also it means you're going to talk to elected people and present the result of your study to elected people in Brussels with geographers and ecologists. So Feel free and thank you very much.